Hello and thank you for joining me. I'm Elizabeth Burden, your host for AZ Illustrated Arts. Tonight, join us for a walk among the compelling shadowy figures created by sculptor Michael Cajero. Meet the new general director of the Arizona Opera who discusses the upcoming season and the company's future in Tucson. Find out how painter Jim Wade draws inspiration from the Sonoran Desert landscape. Learn about early German cinema, including how it is still influencing movies being made today. And hear some soaring music from violinist Beth Donis. But first, today's top stories. Members of Congress are home in their districts right now, but they're not getting much time off. Instead, they're answering constituent questions. U.S. Senator Jeff Flake was a member of the Gang of Eight, which wrote the immigration reform bill that recently passed the Senate. At a lunch today with area business leaders, a number of questions centered on the future of the immigration reform bill now that it's in the U.S. House. Flake says he gives some sort of immigration reform bill a 50-50 chance of passing this year. The House will pass something and then the Senate can conference with that bill and it can become a, a broader bill, so I, I think it will be substantive. The House, uh, I think their preference would be to do it piecemeal. Uh, I don't know if that's possible. Arizona's unemployment rate remained unchanged last month, hovering at 8 percent. The national unemployment rate is 7.4 percent. In July, Arizona saw 15,000 jobs lost, mostly in education as summer employment waned for teachers. Analysts say that is typical, and overall job losses for July were actually lower than normal. And one race for statewide office is over for now. State Representative Steve Montenegro had opened an exploratory committee to run for Secretary of State next year, but now has gotten out of the race and is throwing his support behind fellow Republican Will Cardin, who recently entered the race. Montenegro says he isn't looking to run for any other statewide office. Instead, he'll try and get reelected to the legislature. And that's a look at tonight's headlines. In tonight's first story, we meet Michael Cajero, a prolific artist whose medium is paper mache. Cajero wraps skeletons of aluminum wire in discarded paper to create what he calls representations of the human condition. A large collection of Cajero's work is now permanently installed at the Process Museum, where Luis Carrion went to find out more about this artist's unique vision. Ah, yeah. These instruments, these gloves, uh, they're just not very good. These are I had not been doing any paper mache for maybe almost a year because I got so depressed because I, I couldn't make any more. I didn't have any more room in my studio to make any more work. And in a way, that was good because it gave my, my hands and time to rest because I was having problems with arthritis in my fingers. I'd been working with pressing and and manipulating the material for such a long time, my, my fingers wouldn't work really well. You know, Picasso said that if you want to make a dove, the first thing you do is wring its neck. You know. My name is Michael Cajero. I was born in Tucson in 1947 at St. Mary's Hospital, and I uh, learned how to draw looking at comic books and working from an instructor on TV, uh, Chuck Wagon. It was in the old days. When I moved my collection here of all the work to this building, I, uh, I loaded up, I did all the curating, I did all the installations, and, I, and, I, and I, it was the first time in my life I'd been able to work with space the way I wanted to work with space. I draw in space, that's what I do. 
Each room has a different installation. They deal with different ideas, uh, different themes. And then I have some obscure rooms where the meaning is uh, intentionally obscure so that people can bring their own, uh, uh, their own meaning to the, to the room. What comes first is the image and the form. I don't start with words or with uh, an idea particularly. I get an image. That's somewhat different from a lot of art that's done nowadays because a lot of art is, comes out of concept and then the form comes second. But in my uh, work, I work with the form first and I keep it paramount. I'm always paying attention to the form and how it looks and so forth. You know, pretty simple. You know, it's very understandable and readable. Black is a, is a prominent um, color in the works and they became dark and blackish. And I like the black because they stand out against uh, the, the background. The key is to get a simple image a quick image that reads really quickly. And the black does that. It simplifies the image so you get an instant, instant readout of what you're, an instant gestalt of what you're, you know, what you're looking at. So uh, I've prepared the solution here. This I have to do because uh, the surface is too, you know, it's just too rocky and. It's not like drawing. And I've always felt like I wanted to do that. I'm not satisfied with with flat space, I want, I want real space. I want to get a movement along this way, so I lay the strips through here. Now this, I want to add strength in this. When way. things happen in the world, I, I respond with, uh, maybe not directly, but after a time of, of gestation, I, I start to get an idea. And uh, like the black sites, uh, the various wars during uh, starting in 2003 in Iraq and Afghanistan. And, and I've lived through the Vietnam period, you know. I mean, it goes way back. It just seems like it's been, the country's been involved in a series of wars for a long, long time. My interest is to shed pathos and feeling um, through the work about the human condition and about living in this world. You know, that's, that's what, I, what I want to do, you know, and capture something of what it means to live through this period. The Arizona Opera is now under new leadership. Ryan Taylor assumes the role of general director after spending one year as director of artistic administration. Here to talk with me about the Arizona Opera's upcoming season and the organization's future in Tucson is Ryan Taylor. Ryan, thank you so much for joining me and Absolutely. congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. So what excites you about the Arizona Opera? Why step into the general director position? You know, this is a, it's a transformational time for the company. We have a, a really crack group of staff uh, that have worked tirelessly to make this transition as seamless as possible. We are rebuilding relationships in our communities across the state, not just in Phoenix and Tucson, but in other communities as well. Um, and we have uh, great plans for the future, for the, for the art to be carried forward and partnerships across the state with universities and schools and education programming and there's just so much. There's What do there's you see as the major opportunities for Arizona Opera? If you were to pick two or three, what are they in the coming year? Oh, gosh. You know, I, I feel like um, what we're going to end up doing is really trying to reflect the communities that we serve in a much more cohesive way. Um, you know, the stories, we spoke a little bit about the relevance of opera today, and, and the stories that opera tells are timeless. These are uh, tales that that you read about in the news and the names may have changed and the hemline might have changed a little bit but ultimately what we're talking about with life and love and death and war and revenge and happiness and extreme joy are things that we experience today 
So it's, um, it's a matter for us as an organization to really be able to tell those stories that are relevant in our communities, and we do it to music, because who doesn't like a good story and who doesn't like a good tune? So we just put the two together. So what do you see as the challenges in doing that and the challenges that the comp company faces? Well, you know, uh, there are only seven organizations in the United States that produce as much opera as we do every season. Um, okay. They're relatively large companies. It's Chicago, San Francisco, Seattle, Houston, Minnesota Opera, which serves, of course, um, St. Paul and Minnesota together. Not really two cities, more like one big one. And the Met in New York. Um, our company has a budget that is less than half the size of the next largest organization that produces this much this much work and we're the only one that takes uh, our performances between two cities everyone else is focused in one theater in one place and they don't have to deal with things like housing and travel and um, set up to sort of bring those shows back and forth so um, our challenge is to make sure that we can continue to produce really high quality art um, and do it on on a budget you know? And I, I know the company moved in Phoenix to a new uh, uh, opera center this past year. What are your goals for operations in Tucson? Are there any changes that you see happening? You know, we're making small changes. I, I actually don't think, uh, I don't think we should be spending all of our energy in Phoenix. I think we need to spend uh, an appropriate amount of time in Tucson. Tucson is where our company was born 42 years ago. Our staff loves Tucson. <laughs> we take every opportunity we can get to be here. Just in the last couple of months since the leadership transition, I've been here about once a week and um, and love these folks. I love this community and this city and um, it holds a special place for me and, and has for the past year, but even more so now that I'm getting a chance to meet some of the community a little more personally and up close. So. Um, yeah, I look forward to more growth. We're, we're searching for some office space here. Um, we are uh, gearing up to bring sort of bigger and better things to the city than we have in the past, not just the productions, but other opportunities that are in negotiation, so I can't talk too much about them at the moment. Well, can you tell us what audiences are going to look forward to for the, in the 2013-2014 season? Absolutely. Someone was just as I came in was saying, well, what, are, what are you most looking forward to out of the five shows? And I thought, well, I, I, maybe this show, but n no, I can't really say that because this first one's really good. So, uh, you know, each show that we have has something to recommend it. Uh, we've got HMS Pinafore to start the season, which is the perfect way to, to open a season. It is fun. It is light. It's family friendly in English. Um, we have a, a new hot young director named Tara Faircloth who's coming to direct this piece. And she has a very sort of stylistic, um, beautiful way of moving folks around the stage. It's clean comedy. It's it's just going to be great fun and tunes that you would recognize. Um, and then uh, we've got one of the Mets big stars now, Mark Delavan, who was actually um, raised in Arizona for most of his childhood. Um, he's returning. You've probably seen him on the HD broadcasts as Votan from the Met, and he's coming back to sing the title role in Dutchman. So um, that's something that's extremely exciting for our, for our state. Uh, moving into the spring season, we've got La Boheme with two of the finest casts that you could ever hope for for this opera. Um, many of them sing internationally, and a couple of them have been up the road at Santa Fe Opera in the summer, where a lot of our, our folks like to see opera um, when we're not in season. Um, and then moving into Traviata, we've got uh, a brand new production that's coming to us from Nashville. Um, will be the first company in the Southwest to premiere this piece. Very bright costumes, all sits within a big picture frame, and it really sort of pulls the art uh, out into the house as you watch this piece. So that's pretty exciting. And we're finishing with a new production of Don Pasquale that we're building to be able to tour, and we're setting it in 1950s Hollywood. Well, Ryan Taylor, thank you yeah. so much for joining me today. Absolutely, absolutely. Thanks for having me. While we want to sustain our relationship with Egypt, our traditional cooperation cannot continue as usual when civilians are being killed in the streets. President Obama delivered that rebuke to Egypt's government today in the wake of a bloody crackdown on protesters that left more than 600 dead and thousands wounded. As Egyptians regroup after a wave of bloodshed and chaos, pockets of violence still persist. 
We get an on-the-ground report from Cairo and debate options for the U.S. Then the U.S. Defense Department rolled out its plan to curb sexual assaults in the military. We dig into the details and discuss whether more needs to be done. The maker of the painkiller OxyContin refuses to disclose a full list of doctors who may overprescribe the addictive drug. We have the latest on an investigation by the Los Angeles Times and new pressure from lawmakers. The nation of Myanmar is home to one of the world's most persecuted minorities, the Rohingya. We have the harrowing tale of what happens when this group of Muslims tries to flee to safety. And say hello to the Olingito, the newly discovered mammal species. We talk to the scientists who helped find the creature. That's all ahead on tonight's News Hour. Filmmaker Werner Herzog has a new documentary out. You can see it on YouTube. It's about texting and driving. I don't need to show blood and gore and wrecked cars. What I wanted to do was show the interior side of the catastrophes. I'm David Green, a renowned director's public service announcement on the next Morning Edition from NPR News. In this next story, we meet painter Jim Wade, the recipient of a 2013 Governor's Arts Award. In this story from Luis Carrion, we'll see how hiking in the desert, observing animals, and working in his Tucson garden provide Wade with inspiration for his art. I think wherever I would be, it would, it would affect it. Because again, I, I pay attention, I look. And, uh, take that information in and it somehow comes back out in the paintings and the drawings. But um, so I know it more than any other landscape, this one is the fundamental influence on the work. We garden, I work outside, I you know, try to bring the outside into the work. And I've tried in the paintings, sometimes in my mind, you have different times of day, different sense of humidity, different hours of it, and uh, trying to get a range of different qualities in different paintings. So I'm not just painting the same thing over and over again. For it to be successful, it has to be something that holds my attention, that I can't think of anything else I should do with it. It feels totally satisfying. So in that sense, I'm pleasing myself. But I found that if the more I can get closer to that, the more it connects with other people. I usually listen to music when I'm working, frequently do, and all those ideas, especially from jazz, but any kind of idea of composing interests me. And there have been a number of concerts I've been to where, you know, the way music can transport you that I start getting ideas about painting. So I'm sure it, it does affect, but if I, really pay attention and put in there exactly what, you know, I can peel back the layers and get into what I feel is really down deep and I can really touch that, then oddly enough, all of a sudden it starts communicating to other people. Not be so composed that it tightens down too much. Keep a little bit of an unfinished quality or a little bit of kind of a surprise. I try to surprise myself when I'm working. I think of the work, and the paintings, the drawings, all of it, just the work, as being more involved with being a verb than a noun. So it's something that acts on the viewer rather than a description of something that's known. And so it's a more active relationship so it's about an experience rather than describing something.
I don't know whether you want to call it subconscious, whatever you want to call it. I'm trying to surprise myself, so I'm trying to do things maybe I wouldn't normally have, or that I hadn't done before. Trying to find new combinations of both the shapes, uh, the colors, always trying to get the color interesting and more intense. It's like it's a never ending kind of thing. And each time you open a door, it opens a door to a bigger thing, a bigger experience, right? So instead of doing something that locks you down, hopefully it's a, more of an opening. In at least one way, the modern film-going experience, which allows easy access to movies made around the world, has come full circle. In the days of the silent cinema from the 1900s through 1920s, films from around the world played side-by-side -side at venues across the United States. Germany was one nation that established an early reputation for quality films, and here to tell us more is University of Arizona professor Barbara Costa. Barbara is also an instructor for the Humanities Seminars program, a series of short courses for lifelong learners about a range of interesting subjects. So earlier this year, you taught a Humanities Seminar program about uh, the history of German cinema. Uh, give us a brief overview of what that covered. Um, I began with uh, the Weimar Republic, and uh, I, I actually narrowed it down to sound film. I went got, got the... Um, the Blue Angel at the, at the beginning of the course, and I went all the way through to contemporary German cinema and tried to highlight some of the areas that have to do with German history. Why start with The Blue Angel? Well, it is one of uh, the most prominent uh, films from the Weimar Republic to begin with, and it stars Marlena Dietrich, who's uh, also a very interesting figure that is an international, has become an international figure. Uh, it's also one of Germany's first sound films. And the whole configuration of uh, bringing a director from Hollywood to make the first sound film in Germany, I found very interesting for students to see that cross-cultural, cross-national -nation um, influence. So the post-war era also led to there being several refugee filmmakers, if you will, who emigrated from Germany to the United States. How did that change Hollywood? In the 19, early 1930s, uh, when uh, the Third Reich began in 1933, a lot of filmmakers and actually a lot of people who were involved in the filmmaking process left Germany. And many of those filmmakers came to Hollywood. Among them are Fritz Lang, Billy Wilder, uh, and um, Greg Ulmer. And they really influenced the film noir. A lot of the German street film expressionism uh, was, was a, uh, an aesthetic that that influenced film noir. So why teach humanities seminars this type of seminar in addition to your regular coursework, Barbara? I have to say it was one of my most rewarding teaching experiences. Uh, the uh, participants in the seminars are people who are called lifelong learners. I think that they are you know, people who come from various walks of life. They have careers behind them. Some of them are still engaged with their careers. So they bring a wealth of experience to the classroom and an amazing curiosity and, it's, it's, and, and cultural capital so that I can you know, have a sense that if I mention, for example, Marlena Dietrich, basically everybody knows okay. who she is, right? So it, the, the conversation has, uh, you know, it's, it's a very rich conversation with everybody bringing their experiences to the class. Well, I appreciate the rich conversation we've been able to have today as well. Thank well, you so I've, much for joining me. I've enjoyed it as well. Thank you. Violinist Beth Donis's first full-length album is called The Shape of Spirit. Next, Beth Donis and her partner, guitarist Phil Lipman, perform a song from the album called Awesome Saturday in the AZPM radio studio. One, two, three.
That's our show for tonight. To post a comment on any of these stories or to keep up with the latest news, visit our website, azpm.org. I'm Elizabeth Burden. Thank you for watching.